Hello and welcome to Creative Vitality Jam Sessions. Here we have intimate conversations with extraordinary dance and theater artists about reimagining creativity and supporting and building our beautiful community. CVJS and I walk in solidarity and as allies for equality, justice and respect because Black Lives Matter. President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris preach unity and I say, let's join them. Why not? It just feels better. I'm Helen Pickett and today's guests, we have two, are Daniel Bausinger and Liang Fu. They are two dancers from the Kansas City Ballet and we just finished a project together and we've known each other since 2016. Hi. Hi, Hi Helen. Helen. <laughs> uh, it's so good to see your faces. I, I feel like um, I've had a bit of uh, withdrawal because we had such an intense and fun time working together on our duet. Um, I have to mention your beautiful uh, Christmas background um, with the big star in the tree and 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 that looks like Christmas village behind you, is it? Yes, that is um, uh, my grandma's Christmas village that I inherited and it's very special to me. Oh, well, it's beautiful. I, I actually see the lights in the buildings now. It's, it's really... Really beautiful. My mom actually puts one out at Christmas that's on a table. So she makes a little village. And my mom was a gum surgeon. So she actually found a dentist office <laughs> to put in her little village. It's so sweet. It's so sweet. So, you know, like Saturday Night Live, you're our Christmas show because you're the last uh, conversation of our season. So um, it's apt that we see such a beautiful Christmas background. Um, this is the first question I ask of everybody. Um, I have made it easier, you know, addressing each one of you during the, the conversation. So we won't have like, who's going to answer a situation, but where are you in the world? We're in Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City, Missouri. Great. Okay. And are you going to stay here for the holidays? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, I hope so with that beautiful get up in the back. No, we're gonna leave tomorrow. <laughs> so, uh, Dan Danny, I'll call you if you don't mind. Okay, Danny and Fu. I would like to start with the fact that you are married and colleagues, both dancing at the Kansas City Ballet. So there's a few questions around this and we can go one by one, um, but so, I'll answer the first couple because they're kind of easy. Where did you meet? Was it in the ballet studio? Um, and as colleagues in a profession that you both adore and have committed your lives to, how does this shared work bond create a stronger foundation in your relationship? So where did you meet? In the ballet studio? And then has it created a stronger bond? And I can start um, with you, Danny, and I'll hear from both of you. Yeah, um, so we met, um, I joined Cincinnati Ballet in 2006 as a trainee, um, and Fu joined the company in 2008. And um, we weren't really friends the first year because he was really quiet and shy. Um, it was his first experience in America, so I think he was just trying to feel out the country and where he was and yeah. what was going on in the company dynamic. Um, so we didn't really bond the first year, um, but the second year into the company, uh, we had we found out we had a lot of things in common and we'd go to movies and hang out and talk. And um, I don't know what, like my friends were like, oh, you know, who's single and, you know, like, you know, what do you think? You guys are real close. And I was like, oh, he's my friend. I don't think about him that way, whatever. Um, and uh, I don't know, they just kind of kept like pressing the matter. And I was like, well, what's the harm on like maybe going on a date? Um, so I kind of asked him on a date and then surprised that he said yes. And then the rest is 
history. So we, we met at Cincinnati Ballet and we started dating in 2010. Wow. Anything to add to that, Foo, or is that basically it? Yeah, we were actually friends first. Like we went to the movies. We both loved, loved watching movies. So like we been hanging out outside work as friends. So like from that, we have a, you know, understanding of each other. And then, then we just like, oh, okay, well, let's give it let's a see shot. Where it goes. <laughs> well, it's interesting you say that because I, I really think that um, relationships that are founded in friendship first uh, have a tendency to last through the hard times because that bond is there as friends. It's so important um to to call your partner your f friend really not just like it's it's not just a, a partner is you know like um in another sense or you know in a sexual sense it's really a friend and i find that that's so important in the really tough times um uh my husband and i are also you know great friends and it's uh it's really helped us in tough times but but i do want to actually hear a little bit about this. So um, has your shared bond, uh, so the love of dance, um, how has that made the foundation of your relationship stronger? Um, I, I can say that, you know, when I have a tough time in the studio and, and Right now we're, we're together because we're in a pod all the time, but generally, um, you know, Foo's usually off in another studio and I'm in off in another studio. So we don't actually usually see each other a lot during the day. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we, you know, if I like need advice or I'm partnering with someone and I'm struggling with something, you know, I can always look to him and he, you know, that bond of like knowing each other and, and what ballet is, you know, we can help each other out um, and figure things out better. And, and so I find that it's, it's really helpful that he understands, you know, what I'm doing or when I need help, or even if it's just like, I'm feeling frustrated about my technique, you know, like he can, we can break it down and, and he can give me advice. And sometimes another point of view, he can help you see what you need to achieve or, it just gives you more insight. So I think it's, it, it really helps to have that connection and for each other to understand, you know, the difficulties of being a dancer and an artist and mm -hmm. um, yeah, just, yeah. Res just respecting each other and helping each other out. So mm -hmm. it helps our, our relationship. Yeah. Cause I think most of the time, if you're, um, not dating within the dance world like after work you go to your house and then somebody else if you were partnering but for us we have the privilege to actually bring work home to figure something out so it's like extra time for us to work on something that we both passionate about and try to figure out so the next day we we'll go back it's started in another, another level yeah i mean i think it's uh it is a privilege to, and very rare for two artists to share. Um, yeah, sure, there are artists that live together, but sometimes they're they're not the same kind of artists. But it's it is a rare privilege to share this this kind of bond together. And even though Clemens, my husband, wasn't a dancer, he was the technical director at Frankfurt Ballet, so. You know, I could also share with him in ways that I couldn't share with another partner. And I, artists, uh, I think it could be very hard. I've never experienced something different, but it could be very hard not to have someone that you can really hash things out with, you know, and that you know you're not boring <laughs> the other person. It's it's really it's it's really beautiful. Um, so I said, let me just finish this question. And in saying that you have the ability to speak about work with each other, yeah. So we actually spoke about that. So the shift, I suppose, and you can chime in, there really isn't a shift, right? It's a natural blending from studio to home life, right? 
Yeah. yeah. Some, sometimes it depends on the day. <laughs> um, sometimes when we leave work, we just leave it at work. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, like we were saying earlier, you know, we love to um, watch movies. So like, you know, our, our usual is come home and make dinner. And what are we watching tonight? Um, <laughs> And that's kind of where, you know, like we can just shut work off and, and leave it there. Um, but then there's some days where, you know, it's usually me that needs advice or guidance or help. Um, and so like, I, I need to get it out, talk about it and then leave it for the night. So yeah. it, it definitely depends on the situation in the day. Um, but they, they do tend to, weave in and out of each other but generally we try to leave it work and home so that we're just focused on you know enjoying the moment when we're at home and and resting and of course playing with our dog yeah, exactly <laughs> i always joke to her about like i'm like her therapist joking so I'll charge you 50 an hour and then you can just, you know, tell me everything, which I understand all your feelings and what you're going through. But yeah, we always joke that. <laughs> well, um, it's good to have a therapist in the family. <laughs> and the funny thing is, <clears throat> it might be that it seems, that, uh, Danny, that, you know, it's like this, you're asking Fu and he's, a, he's the therapist. But, you know, there are many kinds of, of, soothings that happen within a partnership. And I'm sure, like I saw that, I have to mention it because I was so impressed, that prime rib and that black forest cake you made for his birthday. If that isn't beautiful love therapy, I don't know what is. So, you know, there are, there are ways that we, that's what a great relationship is built on, right? Mm -hmm. The different ways that we support and help each other and show each other care. So, yeah. Um, Let's see here. Danny, you and I share a place where we train, San Francisco Valley School. And we both had the opportunity to dance with uh, San Francisco Ballet in the bigger productions. I found this very beneficial as far as when I entered a company, when I entered Frankfurt Ballet. So like the rules that you learn within court of ballet dancing have so much to do with community and the stuff that you sometimes only have to get to learn once you're in a company. Um, it also taught me more about community being in that kind of professional environment, but still as an outsider, you know, as an observer, how did this experience benefit you? Um, what did it teach you? Um, and would you shift anything about that training that you had? Yeah, so um, I absolutely loved my training years at San Francisco Valley School. Uh, it taught me so much um, that really helped me uh, transition to being in a company, even as a trainee. Mm -hmm. um, I had had the privilege of being under um, a Balanchine school director, Gloria Gobrin. So um, with our student showcases, we got to do a Balanchine piece every year, which was amazing. Um, and then during the year, um, you know, like you mentioned, we got to be in the Nutcracker with the company. Um, so at a, at a young age, it really taught me that I have to step up my game um, you have to be really on top of everything. You have to um, be able to blend in with these already experienced dancers in order to get the opportunity. Um, so it really pushed my technique and my focus because I wanted to be a part of that group. I wanted, you know, it's not just a given thing that you're in the school and you get that opportunity. You, you know, you've got to be able to look like a company member. And so um, it's a privilege to be a part of that. Um, so I, I had many opportunities to, to perform with them. And then, um, you know, I learned that you have to um, learn every spot and, um, learn quickly because one of our student showcases, um, there was a, a 
the level, the highest level of the school was level eight. I know. And, um, <laughs> they were doing Concerto Barocco for the student showcase. And at the time I was in level seven and level eight um, had filled the whole, the whole piece. And so level seven was covering and there had been one spot that nobody was covering and she got injured and it was like four days before the show. And literally um, Sandra Jennings, who was setting the piece was like, does anybody want to volunteer to go in? And I was just like me. Right um, and so, you know, that's kind of always been my thing. Um, it's really how I got my job in Cincinnati as well. Um, uh, as a trainee, we had our own separate rehearsals and the company was in another room. And one of the dancers got injured. It was a piece with the entire company. Um, so there were no covers. And Victoria literally walked by and was like, are you available? And I was like, yeah. So I just walked into another studio. I learned the ballet did opening night, got offered my job. So it's kind of been my thing to always just like learn everybody, um, know every part, be available, um, be adaptable. And um, I learned all that in school because, you know, you just had to be on top of it all the time. Otherwise, you know, you would, you would miss out on these wonderful opportunities if you, just didn't go for it. Yeah, I mean, extraordinary, but you know, the truth is, is that um, <clears throat> you have, you, you have the drive and the personality to, and what I mean, I'm not, I'm not, you know, when I say personality, very general term, but you know, time and time again, and also through these 54, you're the 54th episode, through these 54 sessions, uh, time and time again, I hear these stories you know, um, that the one of the things that got, one of the main things that got people jobs was simply their desire, their um, focus, and the fact that somewhere they knew, for example, you're volunteering, you know, just that, th these are, there are these subtle things that shift a person's life. And it could be that, you know, Susie or Jennifer in the corner might have learned from your volunteering and maybe volunteered another time. It's all of these examples that, that, that just tumble together. The more people I speak with, the more I look at the, the, the lives of others and hear their stories. Um, there, these, these conversations are replete with people taking the initiative. And it's just so, it's just, um, it's wonderful evidence, if you will, that artists really are the catalysts of their own journey, whatever it may be. And there's a power in that. There's a power in knowing that. Um, so beautiful, thank you. So Fu, um, okay, I'm gonna butcher this, so I need your help. Is it <laughs> King Dao? Qingdao. Qingdao. Okay, so you were born in Qingdao, yes. China. Yes. And so Q is cha. The word R Q is like a cha. Like a chi, like chi. Oh, Qingdao. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, good, good teaching. Thank you very much. Um, and you studied at the Beijing Academy. That's a very big ballet school, right? Yeah, Beijing Dance Academy is like one of the biggest dance academy it's not just ballet but there's Chinese dance and now they have like even I think singing class or something wow yeah okay so I knew that much so so it was so the question one of the first questions so this has a few questions in this so was the academy the Beijing Dance Academy was that like the Royal Ballet School in that you boarded there or did you go oh, okay so boarding school so from my city which is in the east of China it's a coastal city Qingdao so from there when we used to take the train to Beijing is about an hour oh. so we would go um, I was 11 years old I went to 
Beijing Dance Academy, left my parents. Mm -hmm. And then we, you know, you lived there in the dorm with the, all your classmates. And then every day you take, like, we have academic and ballet class throughout the day. Every day it changes. Some day you start in the morning, like eight o'clock, mm -hmm. you got ballet class for like an hour and a half. And then you go to academic for an hour and a half and then you have lunch. And then in the afternoon, there's like an hour and a half repertoire class. And then another an hour and a half for uh, academic. So every day, like it changes. And then wow. in the evening, twice a week, you have um, like ballet class, more like a technique technique class in the studio and then other three nights you have a like in the classroom to do your homework and then wow. you, yeah you live there so I only got to go home twice a year to see my parents in the one in Chinese New Year one in the summer wow yeah that's that's similar I know in the Royal Ballet School also they they, they take they can take kids very young like 11 it's 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 so young to leave your parents yeah yeah, wow. I was, I was kind of excited. I was like, wow, well, you know, go to Beijing, like the capital. And then, of course, they were excited for me. But at the same yeah. time, you know, you you letting your kid go to somewhere that such a young age for the parents. Like, you know, they come to visit in the first few years more often. But then as the time goes on, you know, I was like, I'm, I'm good here. I have all these friends and <laughs> I'm busy. <laughs> so. Do you, so this is, unrelated uh because i have more to ask of this question but do you think that you could uh, if if you guys have children do you think you could let go of your kid at 11 i would think so i'm, I'm more like the tough little you know tough kind of and i would be i think i think if i could do something my kid should be able to <laughs> that's, that's nice that's beautiful um so um then you went on to dance once you, which grad, graduated. You went on to dance with many international companies: Singapore Dance Theater, Universal Ballet, Senior Soloist in Cincinnati Ballet, and then Kansas City Ballet. During this time, you were invited to perform at the gala of the Benoit de la Danse competition at the Bolshoi Theater. Uh, in Moscow, Russia. I stood in front of that in 2016 for the first time. And it's amazing how all my little girl, you know, all these dreams like bubbled up from when I was a little girl and I thought about the Bolshoi. It's amazing. I was just standing in front of it. Um, and then that was in 2003. And then in 2005, you were awarded the first prize at the 10th Asian Pacific International Ballet Competition in Tokyo. So your career involved a lot of travel and I would say adventure. Uh, did you always know you wanted to dance internationally? And did the world call to you? You know, was it, was it something like, yeah. So what was that like? I think so. Like I'm, I'm a adventurous. Like ever since I, when I was little, I started dance, not even ballet. Like when I was nine years old, was, that's, that's when I started. And we have like this dance class and then academic, we st start learning English. So at the time I was thinking, you know, without acknowledging there's ballet company or there's even thing called ballet. Cause I, all I knew it was just dance, you know, kids doing move around. So I was like, huh, I want to, really focus on English because I kind of want to go explore the world. So I was always focused, not falling asleep in class. And I, I was like the top of the class for the English. So like my teacher always calls me out, you know, we always have the book and make conversations. And then, you know, I would stand out with somebody else and then we talk in English. So from there, and then that led to uh, Binion Dance Academy, which is travel away from home. It's a different environment and mm -hmm. I was excited about that. And then um, my, so I studied six years in Beijing Dance Academy. On the fifth year, Hong Kong Ballet, they were doing a production of uh, La Fimo Gatti. And then they needed extra dancers. So the ballet master came to our school where we were kind of the top of class at the time. And then we were looking for two male uh, boys to go fill up the course spot. So I was lucky enough to be one of the two 
wow. chosen to go to Hong Kong. You, that, at that time, Hong Kong is kind of like a foreign country because that's year 2000. So they were under uh, British, um, they were British colony until 1997. Yeah. So they just came back to China for three years. And then two of us found out the news. We were like, oh my God, we're going <laughs> to Hong Kong. Like that was huge to me. And then we were there for a, a month. And then, you know, they found us apartment. We danced with the company. So that was so cool because in school, all you have is just that your same age classmates, you dance all the time. So that really opened my eyes to outside of China and what I can do. So, and also like during, in school, um, all these international ballet companies come to perform in Beijing. The good thing being in Beijing is kind of like it being in New York, you know, all the companies will go there and perform. So we've had, I've seen so many performances like with Royal Ballets, Romeo and Juliet, we were the extras on stage because they needed like, you know, soldiers, standing in the back so we I, I was standing in the back watching all the stars dancing on stage and with same with the Stugar ballet they did Romeo and Juliet so I saw the two of the best version of Romeo and Juliet John Krankos and uh, McMillan yeah. yeah so I was there watching <laughs> and then uh, Royal Danish ballet too and just to see all these things and it makes me wonder oh, what if I can you know be on stage with that environment not not saying like, cause in China it's very different. And when we watch, when I was in school watching National Ballet of China um, performances, they do classical, but mostly at that time, it's uh, like the Chinese themed story. Oh yeah. With, about the Red Army or those things. I was not really like passionate or interested in that. I want to do like proper classical like you know Swan Lake, Romeo and Julia, these kind. So that that give me the uh, hope and maybe I can get out and go somewhere else and do that. So then when I was graduating, the director from Singapore Dance Theater came to our class again, <laughs> look for dancers. And then she picked four of us. I was one of the four to pick two guys and two girls to go to Singapore. I was like, wow, Singapore, that's a it's another country and, yeah. and another great go, city yeah i can go there and explore and so I, that's that's the first steps like i knew i wasn't gonna stay there forever because at that time watching all the um, ballet videos and performances i wanted to come to america so mm -hmm. that was you know like and so many students uh higher than me in school like some of them made it to America. So I always think like, wow, they can make it. Maybe I can make it too. Yeah. So from there, like went to Singapore, from Singapore, went to Korea. Because yeah. Singapore Dance Theater at the time, it was about 22 dancers. So it wasn't a big company, but we had a great repertoire. And then we went on tour to different places. We toured to Mexico, toured to UK, and we toured to Korea. That's when I auditioned for Universal Ballet. And that's a company of 60 dancers. So that's oh, a much bigger wow. company. But that company um, does more classical, like the Russian version classical ballets. So from there, I had an opportunity to, to come to America to go to Cincinnati Ballet. So I was like, wow, this is it. This is like what I always wanted to do and it's actually happening. So I, I love traveling, seeing different companies in a different culture. That's something I'm really excited about. Yeah, I mean, I hear it. And, you know, again, like just thinking about young, you know, young, young, in, in influenceable dancers or artists, you know, just the seeds that got planted in you. I mean, you had this, you know, you were, you were a curious kid, obviously, and 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 you knew very young you wanted to learn a language that you know, English that you thought at the time, well, this is, you know, this is part of a piece of the puzzle that will enable me, you, to, you know, basically you knew at a very young age that you needed certain things that could afford you all of this travel or adventure and exposure. And again, you know, <clears throat> 
so important about these small choices that we seem to make, you know, I'm saying small because at the time it was just a kid's choice, but you know, it enabled you much easier to, to actually weave through this very international wish that you had and Hong Kong talk about a great city. I actually went on tour there in 97, the last year oh, wow. before. Yeah. And we were uh, performed flew over that performance. It was amazing. And I remember uh, we were staying on the Kowloon side. And I remember seeing, you know, what they call the, the boats, the junks, mm -hmm. uh, what they yeah, and and thinking, this is it's like the feeling I had when I was in Istanbul. There is such an old and new just swirling together, and you feel because I love history. You feel the history of it. The bird market was amazing to walk through that bird market. I was just, it, it, you know, the, it was just something so different than what I had experienced. And um, I also have the travel bug. And just a side note for both of you, um, I don't know when you will retire, but we're dancers and at one point we do. Um, is travel part of your future plans? Like, would you like to travel the world and see more? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. We, we have this conversation quite often about, you know, do we plant roots and start a family or do we kind of travel and see the world and, you know, where, where, see where life takes us. So um, we both really, I mean, we, with like our honeymoon, we went to Thailand. I don't think a lot of people, you know, people like to go to like beaches and relax. We wanted to like, you know, go through caves and canoes and see all types of, you know, different culture and eat different foods. And that's kind of where um, we have a, a, a similar bond uh, in that respect. As much as we do like the beach, but we can kind of go <laughs> to the beach anytime in a way, yeah. um, you know, but yeah, we both, we both love to try different foods and um, experience different cultures. I mean, I know for me, the first time going to China was a, a little bit of a culture shock um, just because I actually hadn't really, that was like the first thing that didn't feel like home. The first time I went to Paris, it kind of felt yeah. like the, the U.S., but more sophisticated. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I really haven't been, um, you know, that I haven't really gone that many places. I have desires. Um, like one of the top places for me to go is Egypt. I would love oh, to. Me too. I still haven't been and it's been my bucket list since I was a kid. Yeah, I, I mean, I have been to the Sinai, the Sinai. So I have been to the Red Sea, and that's glorious. Um, actually, from the Israeli side, a lot, and then we drove into it, so it was really amazing. But um, so, okay, another side thing because Thailand is very close to my heart. Because uh, uh, anyhow, uh, it, I'll just leave it at that um, because this is about you guys. But where, I just have to find out where in Thailand you traveled. Um, so we we did spend a couple of days at the beach in Phuket. Okay. Um, and uh, we, we took a boat out to James Bond Island and we did canoeing through caves and um, it, was, it was quite spectacular. And then we went to Bangkok um, Great city. We did the city, you know, um, and we went to an old, we took a tour to an old ruins um, that was kind of what, like two hours? Yeah, two like hours that. outside of, of Bangkok. Um, and it was, it's quite beautiful. It's stunning. Did you go north? Um, yeah, I think it's it like a two north. hour north of Bangkok or something. But I mean, did you, was it Bangkok and Phuket? That's where you went to? Yeah. yeah. Bangkok's an amazing city. It is. I, the river, the river has such life. And one of my favorite things to do is just to get into a water taxi and you okay. can actually get into one and go all the way to the last stop. 
in the water taxi. And there's a little separate island that's still a part of Bangkok, but it's really, it's an island that, so you have to get off the water taxi and then take a tinier boat to the island and you can rent a bike and, you know, basically go around the island in about an hour. But you can, I mean, there were days where I just loved to be on the water and watch the life. And you watch the traffic and the big barges and it's crazy. And then going down there at night and seeing all the lights and seeing how the river is still alive. It's such, it's such a life force. Mm -hmm. It's called the Chao Praia River. Yeah, yeah. Wow, okay. Oh man, <laughs> oh, all this, okay. Um, both of you have danced classical, neoclassical and contemporary works. Um, I'll hear from Fu first, and then I'll go back to you, Danny. How do these three styles support each other, and how do the differences inform each other? I think, um, so when I was in school, we uh, mostly studied classical ballet, and then the last couple of years, we started having contemporary classes, but I, from what I remember, it's nothing compared to the contemporary works that we do these days. So I really, all I knew was classical ballet. And then I went to Singapore, there were lots of contemporary works. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what is this? You know, like I didn't really understand anything about it, but then watching it, it makes me feel like, oh, wow. You know, it could move like that, or it could be like this. You don't have to, you know, stay straight and spot your head or all those things. So that's where I really got into contemporary where I have an understanding and a know that something that you not only you need to have classical, but you need to have contemporary to be more full as a dancer. And then coming to the States, that's where I started doing um, Balanchine's works, which is more like a neoclassical ballet. So to me, I think you still need the foundation of a strong classical training. And then neoclassical, it just a uh, you know, change in accent or certain musicalities. And, uh, but they, I feel like classical ballet and neoclassical ballet uh, tie together more closer than having contemporary. Contemporary, it's, is the way for you to be free, for you to really get out of, you know, always, because you can only hold yourself up so, so much yeah. throughout the day or in your lifetime. You have to, you know, sometimes let go, really, there's not a correct form for contem contemporary. So you, as a dancer, like in Singapore, it was more contemporary than classical, which I miss classical. When I was in Korea, it's more classical than contemporary. And I, I miss contemporary. So I feel like after you have understanding the differences, you, you know you want to have all of it in you to be more uh, versatile as a dancer. Yeah, yeah. Danny? Um, I, I, we kind of have a similar uh, path in that way that I only had contemporary classes um, at San Francisco Ballet School in the summer program, actually. Um, it was not a part of our year round classes. It was basically just technique, point, pas de deux, and then rehearsals. Um, so uh, I didn't. You mean ballet technique? Yes. Um, so I didn't get a lot of practice uh, in that kind of environment um, until I got into a company, and um, I I was you know younger and an apprentice and kind of working my way up. So. I had to really kind of learn on my own um, how to, to let go of the classical training. Um, and it took me a long time to figure that out. I was trying to always hold like we do in ballet, um, like hold my positions in contemporary and then I would just fall over. Um, and it was, it really actually was, um, the first time I partnered with a guy who was good at contemporary and knew how to move that I learned how to let go and trust. Um, 
yeah, because I, I, once you get into a company, I think that you don't, nobody can really guide you or, or well, they can, but nobody in can, has the time to really teach you how to move. You've just got to absorb. Um, and a lot of the times when I was in Cincinnati, I wasn't even in the room to learn because I wasn't that kind of mover, you know, we, they would cast the ballet and I wouldn't be casted because I'm just, I wasn't that type of mover. And I finally asked my director, I was like, even if you don't want to use me, can you put me in the room so I can learn how to move so I can try? Um, and I started to, you know, that's when I kind of started to, um, feel it myself but it wasn't really until I could have someone to you know counterbalance and make me um sink down but know that they would be there to catch me and have that trust that I actually learned how to trust my own body in that movement um so it took me a lot longer because I didn't start doing a lot of contemporary until I got to Kansas City Ballet oh wow yeah well, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Wow. And the first time we did pedal, you did the improv girl, right? Um, yeah. And then I had surgery, so I didn't get to perform it. But... but the thing is, what's interesting is that I cast you in the improv girl. So, you know, uh, I just think it's interesting that that Kansas City was, you know, the first place you started doing this. And because I, I consider that role one of the hardest because it's really where you have to think for yourself. Like, because yeah. your solo is improv. So that's, that's very interesting. I just want to, a few things, I think it's just semantics, but because I'm a contemporary ballet choreographer, but I have the classical training, I, I, I really love, and I should be more specific, I have the classical ballet training. It's super important to be uh, specific about, about, because there's many classical, there's classical Chinese dance, there's many classical forms classical ballet, like you two, I have a foundation in that. And so I really believe in the technique, but also, so my life, I went completely into a creative contemporary world with, with Bill Forsyth, right? At 19. So right out of that school and having had the classical training, and what I learned early on is, and this is what I try to say to dancers, is try to take away the separation. Because the feeling of dance and the feeling of movement, well, that's what it is. So the more I can really have the conversation about this, uh, classical ballet is a training, I revere the technique, but is it, is it, it the more, the more conversations I can have about it not being a separate thing, you use all that information you have, like any technique. That's, I love technique. I love technique in all things. I love, you know, the, the technique of writing, music, you know. I mean, there's a famous, you know, quote that uh, I'm not remembering now, but I'm paraphrasing it that, you know, in order to play jazz, you have to know, really know what your your technique, your musical technique. So you can break the boundaries. It's just something you said, Fu. You know, to break, to be able to have the knowledge so you can, to use your words, be free. And my argument is that you can feel that freedom in ballet. I really, you know, it's just something I really deeply believe. And I think that I'm sure you two have felt that. And maybe it is the influence of contemporary that allows the freedom in classical ballet to happen. Maybe that is an inroad. I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's see. Um, as a couple in dance, uh, do you see your futures in dance? Um, I do. Um, I, from, I'd say probably from when I was in school, um, I have always wanted to be a stager or a repetitor. Oh. Um, I had a wonderful, I, I 
literally like loved watching Sandra Jennings set ballets and talk about how Balanchine would want this or that and sharing that knowledge from the source itself was so fascinating to me because it, it felt like I felt like a Balanchine dancer, even though I wasn't, because she was literally passing on all of his words of wisdom to us. Um, and I loved that continuation of the history of ballet or, or any piece in general. Um, I also just, um, in the studio, I find that I ask a lot of questions. The more I understand the piece, I feel like the more I can, the more involved I can be and let myself go and just feel the piece instead of me doing the piece. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I tend to talk and be super involved <laughs> all the time. Um, and I had the opportunity to um, help, you know, stage a piece here in Kansas City, um, actually, when, when I had my surgery um, during pedal, I um, helped Adam Hoagland's Rite of Spring um, because we had done it in Cincinnati and he knows that I have that like repetitor niche um, and so I got to sit in the front of the room and run rehearsals and, um, you know, teach things and coach everybody. Um, and so that was like a wonderful experience for me. Um, and I just, again, with the travel bug, um, I would love to, to go set ballets when COVID is over um, and I'm retired. Uh, <laughs> all over the world because how cool is it to like again continue your passion of dance share it with the next generation and be in a city that you know is paying you to be there but you know you don't get to go to very often so that's kind of like my life my next lifelong dream um well, because I, I don't think i can leave dance once I'm done with dance, I feel like I, I want to keep passing it on. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And Fu? Oh, <laughs> watching the house and take care of the dog while she's away. <laughs> 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 okay. So originally I, you you know, like as a, being an adventurous, even though I, I've invested like most of my life in dance, but like when I originally had the idea, it's like, oh, you know, I have danced all my life so far. What if I do something else? What if I try, try something else? Like, what? where would that take me? But I mean, I haven't set my eye on anything specific or invested in really in anything. Because for me, I feel like I can't split my focus, do yeah. ballet and something else. I am like, a, it, I ha have to be either focusing one thing yeah. and then shut off and focus on another. Otherwise I won't be able to do well for the things that I'm focusing on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like through the pandemic, I started taking pictures, I got a camera. So like photography is something kind of interests me because it, it's kind of an art form too. Because photography, uh, art, that's like something. And, and also like massage therapist, like I've always interested, you know, as a dancer, we understand the human body. Like mm -hmm. it, I have friends before they were ballet dancers first and then they become a massage therapist and they were really good because mm -hmm. you really know how to work the body. So yeah. that's something I like, it's on back of my mind too. But as of right now, like just, you know, still focusing on the dance world, but, you know, hoping this pandemic will end and I can actually, get back to normal and really enjoy the last few years of my career. Yeah, I know. It's that big if, right? It's gonna come. Um, and, and now there's light at the end of the tunnel, which is really important, I think, for all of our psyches, you know? Um, so, ooh, 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 let's see. 
what are your philosophies? So wait a minute. Yeah, that's really it. Okay. Yeah. We're on the third page. What are your philosophies about being artists? Um, so what does it mean and what does it take to be an artist in your opinion? Fu, I'll start with you. I think to me, you have to have passion. That's first thing, because if you're not passionate or interested about something, you would not put all your focus on it. And then you would just do it halfway and then it's not going to take you to where you are. And to have the passion and understanding the art form you're pursuing and knowing that it's not going to be all smooth and mm. all happy all the time, you have to go through some difficulties. And to once you have the passion and ask yourself, is this something I want to do? Is this something I <clears throat> really want to pursue? And then make the commitment because once you make the commitment, you know you can't go back. This is this is the only way, you know, going forward. There's no other choice. And then that will make you not just an artist, but a more su successful artist. Yeah, yeah, Danny. Um, I think uh, what I've learned and what maybe I could share with with you know younger people so they can learn faster um, is that like being an artist you have to trust yourself um, you know you have to trust the people around you that are coaching you and guiding you um, when, when it comes down to you know, putting yourself out there you've got to trust all of the knowledge that you've gained over the years and really live in the moment um, and and you know I, I learned later in life that um, trying to control everything you do on stage is impossible. And then, you know, when you're trying to control it, you're not really enjoying it. And so um, I think to be a full artist, you've got to let go of that control and just relish in the moment. Um, and, and just let things be. If something doesn't work, you know, you just keep going and you keep pushing, but knowing that, you know, you've tried your best is good enough. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that being an artist, you have to, you have to be able to find that freedom and, and trust the people around you that, you know, they're going to, they're going to help you be the best that you can be, but you also have to let that go. Like you have to trust that that's, you know, what you're doing and trying is is enough, so. Yeah, and, and I, just going a step further, um, you know, maybe shifting the idea of thinking that something didn't work. So, you know, let's say you fell out of a pirouette, but what did that negotiation, what did that bring you? You know, so instead of saying, you know, oh, my God, I didn't make the triple turn or I fell off, you know, I went to half point or whatever. But it's the negotiation within, let's call it the problem th that can be so exciting and so present. And, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but I noticed when I fell on stage <laughs> and I fell a lot uh, when I fell on stage or when something didn't work boy, did it smack me back to the present. And I was so present for the rest of that piece. Absolutely. And that, what you said is relish in the moment, that give up of what you think you need to be doing <laughs> instead of just, like you said, being there, you know? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I got to a certain point, just that exact situation, you know, like realizing that when something doesn't go the way I want it to, somehow the rest of the performance, whatever it may be, was was like me actually like doing even better because I was like, oh, that was, you know, I want them to remember not that moment, but the rest of it. Yeah. So then it was like, you know, the rest of that piece was was better than anything I did before, because I just kind of was like, oh, well, I'm going to fix that. Let me show you kind of drive. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of was trying to take that idea 
and try to like let it like let that happen from the beginning so mm -hmm. i'm not worrying about oh is this perfect is this perfect is this perfect i'm just going to be like hey guys i'm going to show you what i got and hopefully you enjoy it <laughs> and it actually helps me you know you know feel more confident and less nervous or fearful yeah. uh, when it when it comes to performing so yeah yeah well, my two lovelies, we are to the, uh, at the three questions that I ask everybody. Um, I'll ping pong back and forth. So I'll start with you, Danny. Can you share? I know we have many. I have to always. <laughs> but can you share a favorite? Maybe it's something that comes to you right now, a favorite or impactful memory from your creative life. And Fu, you have a moment to think, you lucky one. <laughs> um. I'm going to start with the most recent one, which was our um, collaboration and our duet. Um, I guess this year, I think obviously has been hard for everyone. Um, the arts is, is really struggling um, in a way to keep moving forward. And I loved um, when the pandemic first started, um, the best part about it was sitting at home and watching people put stuff on the internet to, to, um, you know, see other companies and see other pieces. Um, and then that kind of evolved into people starting to do, you know, things that, um, uh, creations via zoom at home, like you did with your home studies. And um, I know Annabelle Lopez Ochoa also did a bunch of, of Zoom choreographies. And that creativity gave me hope. I was feeling pretty lost, um, pretty sad about everything. And um, just being able to watch other dancers and creative processes really lifted my spirits. Um, then Kansas City Ballet had told us that, you know, we were canceling Nutcracker, um, but they were going to try to bring us back and we were going to try to do something. Um, and I was really excited at just the thought of even just being in a studio. I mean, the fact that we were dancing on, I was dancing on carpet in my house, holding a chair <laughs> as a bar, um, some days it really was, you know, moving felt great. And then after the class was over, I would just feel, you know, diminished and depleted. Um, so getting back into the studio was step one of being incredibly grateful that we had this opportunity. And then we got, you know, we, we started back rehearsals and, you know, Devin was like, we're going to have this piece. You're going to zoom with Helen. You're going to create a work. And I was just like mind blown that this was <laughs> even possible, um, that we were going to have this wonderful opportunity to create, not even just pick up, you know, a nutcracker paw that we do every year to create something new. Um, and for me, it was really special because Fu and I don't actually get to partner a lot or haven't until recently. Um, and to be able to do it in this time, in this situation with you at home in the studio and then film it at a PBS location, um, was it's something I will never forget. And um, I'm incredibly grateful for because it just brought, it brought so much joy in every aspect. Uh, I, I felt just incredibly lucky to be a part of something so special um, during a time that felt so hopeless. Mm -hmm. And, um, to be able to do it with him to, you know, like I said, we don't, we don't get to partner often. So to be able to have a romantic pas de deux where we get to be a couple um, was really special to me. So I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to you and to Devin and to him for 
so taking that, care of me. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, beautiful, I, it, beautiful, beautiful memory. Um, beautiful. Yeah. I know I used the word a lot, Foo. You were so cute. You were like, beautiful. <laughs> so, uh, so, so ooh, what about what, you know, after that, man, no pressure. But what did you <laughs> Well, I agree with her 100%, but I, I'll just, I have some funny memories. Okay. Uh, joyful, but funny. Uh, so when I was in Universal Ballet, we were doing Giselle, and I was a uh, Wilfred. So he's the guy who's always behind Albert, you know, holding his sword and all those things. So, you know, at the act, act one, the match scene, at the end, you know, we're Giselle's dying and then he's all sad and everybody's supposed to like before the curtain comes down you stay on stage everybody's like crying so I my job was going off stage get the cape and then come on and get to Albert and take him away so I ran off stage I grabbed the cape running back on stage and then I step on the tape I did a full split <laughs> on the floor I just my head was on the floor I just ate the floor and then I was like oh no and then I tried not to laugh and then I get up and try to go to him I could see everybody else is like posing but like shaking because they were all laughing trying to keep the head facing upstage and then I grabbed him then we ran up and I was like oh I'm so sorry like I did not mean to do that because even for Albert he's like the senior principal there and he, he was like trying not to laugh running off stage in such a moment, you know, it was supposed to be devastated everybody, but good thing it was a dress rehearsal. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, I, tell you, I, I was like, oh no, I just ruined the whole thing. But, oh God, I tell you, props are dangerous. <laughs> props are dangerous. Yeah, we watched a video about your uh, stick last night. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm a student, right, in San Francisco Ballet, and I'm living in that brain. As I said, the stick was the most important. I could not, in my student brain, just <laughs> think about letting the damn stick go. <laughs> like, you know, this and a back bend and bore it. Oh my God. Good to laugh about those things. <laughs> there was another one. So yes, when I was yes. in Cincinnati, I was, uh, um, we were doing Cinderella. I was one of the stepsisters. So oh, we nice. wear this huge wig that is like 12 inches or something. And then for the two sisters, we wear like a, what is that? Two inch heel? heel? Yeah. Like so on Kitten stage. Heel. Yeah, uh, I, I was, Maya was purple. And there's in the scene of the ballroom where the two sisters get to dance, you know, like crazy dance and stuff. So on stage, this is a during performance. So we were doing dancing because there's no, not really such a choreography because you're supposed to look bad and not know how to dance. So I was just doing these high kicks and, you know, having fun. And then one of my shoe flew, I kick and then I just went off my foot and then the huge arch and then it went to the august repeat i i thought for a second it, it went up in the air i was going to chase it i thought it would land on stage but as i got to the edge of the stage it went into the august repeat i was like oh no Stop. okay go back i keep dancing i was like oh hope they didn't hit any musicians because you know i don't want to hit them then you hear the like yeah and the whole time I was like, oh, my God, what just happened? Oh, I don't know. So I, I had the rest of the act with one shoe on. And then somebody were during uh, intermission or something. I were able to go grab the shoe and then brought it back. But it was hilarious. The whole audience were laughing. Of course. And, <laughs> and afterwards, uh, my director, Victoria, was like, oh, my God, that was so fun. Everybody laughed. And I was like. Yeah, I heard, but I was like, oh, my God, my shoe. <laughs> it was yeah, like, oh, my God, like you said, did somebody get the shoe on the head? Yeah. <laughs> well, that, thank you. You know, no one has brought up really, really funny memories. That's fantastic. Great. <laughs> okay, let's bring it back. Let's bring it up. Um, do you have, uh, I'll stay with you, Phil. I'll start with you this time. Do you have an insight or daily inspiration that you can share about living a creative life? I think for me, I always try to 
stay positive and you know there's always light there's always good in anything i believe that you just have to choose what what, what do you want you know at the end of the day i always try to think okay so today it's whatever happened happened like tomorrow is a brand new day you can't bring today's negativity to tomorrow like tomorrow in the morning you wake up okay so this is what i'm gonna do today like yesterday it's in the past so mm -hmm. in every situation if you think about the positive side they it wouldn't take you to a dark place that you know no one wants to be but i think once you have anything like negative it just takes you down you would just start drowning so i always try to be the positive one in the studio and you know always try to help people to see the light you know there's always good and evil but there's always the light there's always light yeah Fu. I'm, I'm with you there's always light yeah and beautiful danny what do you have <laughs> um I always kind of similar, but I always try to um, be better than I was yesterday. Okay. Um, so when I wake up in the morning and I start my class, I just try to always grow and learn and watching other dancers, whether it be my colleagues or um, someone in the front of the room demonstrating something um, I always try to pick up as much knowledge to make me a more versatile um, artist and um, just like always giving 150% um, whether it's mental or physical or both um, on a daily basis and always trying to just learn and grow. I think that as an artist, you you can never um, stop learning from um, so many experiences of other people. And, you know, we, we have this wonderful opportunity to have choreographers from all over, all types of genres, um, so instead of feeling like I settle in my own body with my own comfort zone, really just trying to look at what's in front of me and absorb as much as I possibly can and, and tr like push myself to um, get past the comfort of what is natural for me and try new things all the time. Um, so in a nutshell, just, just push past your boundaries and uh, constantly grow. Right on you too, yeah. Our last question is um, important, an important one. They're all important. It was a great interview, you guys, but um, uh, I should say conversation. Um, in supporting and building a more equitable dance community, what are some specific daily practices we can be active with? I think um, we should definitely all have, have to have the understanding of each other. doesn't matter the gender, color, like you have to understand everybody's story. You know, everyone is different in this world. And same in the studio, everyone is different. They have a different way of approaching things, but if you don't understand somebody, then don't try to, you know, think what they are. I think you have to, you have, have, have to have a deep understanding. Then you can have your respect for why they're doing that or their decision. And, you know, like sometimes I see in the studio here, you know, in Korea, Singapore, and even everywhere that if we have a rule or a standard, sometimes it doesn't apply to everybody. Like, for example, like women and men, you know, sometimes in the studio, like the standard don't really apply the same to women and men. You know, as, as being a male dancer in China, it's a little different than here. Because when I went to school, we have 
almost the same amount of uh, boys and girls in the same class. But in America, I see unless it's a, you know, big school like San Francisco Valley School, usually there's always more girls than boys. It could be like 20 girls in this class and then four boys. So, so straight away, the four boys feel more privileged because it's hard to find boys in dance here. But it doesn't mean that you know, they should have a less of a standard compared to the girls. If something uh, like goes for the girls, they should apply to the boys too, even though yes, they it's hard to find, but that shouldn't matter. I feel like if you really want- Make the boys more elevated, that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah they shouldn't have the privilege of getting yes. away you know, with certain things just yes. because yeah. there's very few of them. I think, yes, at the end of the day, you might lose them, but that's what we need to do to have the standard applied to everybody. Because if, once you let one thing slip and then the next one will keep rolling, they just get bigger and then everybody will learn on that. I think just to just have an understanding and then have the rules set for everybody has to follow. It doesn't matter your sex, your color, where are you from, who you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And Danny? I mean, we both um, kind of, you know, had, we had talked about this and, and uh, yeah, just, just treating um, each other equally. I, I, you know, like he said, um, whether you're male or female or white or, you know, uh, African American. You know, it's it, yeah. People, any people of color. Um, you know, it's it's uh, giving everybody a fair shot, no matter what they look like or who they are. And like he said, you know, having a very deep understanding. Um, you know, some people, you may say something to someone and it gets a positive reaction and then you may say the same thing to another person and it might make them upset. So understanding how to communicate to each other um, and, and not always seeing it as like, oh, well, you're, you know, you're not listening because you got upset about it. I'm trying to understand why that person got upset and maybe approaching it in, in a different manner. Um, just human, we all have, uh, different opinions and um and I we also come from different cultures and yeah and i think we have to learn about each other um and not just say well this is how i do things so you need to adapt to how i do things yeah. i think we all need to adapt to each other and and that will bring out everybody's best versions of themselves. I think the more that we understand each other, the more confident we can be and the better, the, the more confident you are, the better um, you're, you recept, you're receptive to more things and open to more things instead of feeling like there's this wall of, you know, between because you're not communicating well, there's a wall that I think people can put up to protect themselves so they don't feel hurt by someone, you know, saying something that that isn't um, sitting with you well. Well, so, and also, also in that, it's it's making sure you check yourself because it's also about how it's not just that something might not sit well. You sometimes we have to take stock of our own language. Absolutely. You grow up, you know, in a certain way in a certain culture. And we have to take stock of our own language and make sure that the generalizations, perhaps our generalizations uh, are exactly those, exactly that, and not just not being mindful of all, all the possibilities that are presented in this beautiful world. Yeah, like, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's exactly what you said, it's learning about the different cultures and, and, and getting open, you know? And like you said, going to China the first time, that was a, a culture shock because you did not know so much about the culture, but you had someone next to you 
who was of the culture and could and could bring you, you know, into this world in a, in a far different way than you being there on your own. And through that, the learning, you know, and similarly, you know, it, it, I mean, for me, it's what makes the world go round. It's the beauty to, 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 to sit and be and listen with, with um, and for me, it, and I, this is what you're saying. It makes a community, uh, it makes our community, it, period. It's what we're made of. It, we are made of differences and the beauty of those differences and the integral part of those differences and how it makes our community so full and rich. So I'm just, you know, I'm just riffing on what the two of you said basically, but um, yeah. Yeah, you guys, um, uh, you know, I feel like uh, we got to know each other better through our work on the duet and then just continuing the conversation. And uh, thank you so much. It was such a rich, uh, and generous and kind conversation. And uh, it was really wonderful having the two of you also as a couple, because we don't have that so often, you know, on the show. Um, maybe it's, maybe I think the first or second time, but um, do you have a place, like, do you have, either of you have a website or do you have, or people can find out more about you. I mean, they could simply go to Kansas City Ballet Right, the, the website there and find out more about you. Anything else where they might want to find out more about the two of you or each of you? She's more active on social media. Okay. <laughs> but she, she posts everything about both of us. Usually. Okay. Um, I, I have an Instagram, which is um, Mrs. Fu62416. That's our wedding anniversary. Okay. Um, and uh, I have a Facebook as well, which is Danielle Bausinger Fu, um, mm-hmm. because I I kept my Bausinger is my maiden name, and it was also my stage name um, my whole career. And so when we got married, I changed everything but that, um, so that my audience could could still remember me from. And it's like my career name, I guess is what I. What's your name? <laughs> yeah. And then um, he has a he has his Facebook and he doesn't Instagram, but I kind of I kind of do the like you said the posting for the both of us. If he posts anything, it's usually about food. <laughs> yes, near and dear to my heart, food. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> the roast beef and the black forest cake. That was insane. That was amazing. How tall was that cake, man? That's. <laughs> Like it took me a, about a week to eat all of it because she doesn't <laughs> like uh, cherries. So uh, every night, and I had it for lunch and for uh, after dinner. <laughs> Good thing day. we were working. <laughs> so um, let's see. Um, in the description box below, you will find a short bio from both uh, Danny and Fu. And um, we're gonna be taking a little winter break. Creative Vitality Jam Sessions is gonna be on break from December 14th um, until January 16th. Uh, And then we'll start back with exciting new guests on the 17th. So I'm gonna wish everybody a really great holiday season. Um, Please be healthy. Uh, let's, Let's, the light is at the end of the tunnel. Like I said, it's a pleasure sitting here um, twice a week and um, offering these amazing people to you. Uh, So I wanna thank you again, you two. Thank you so much uh, for this beautiful talk that we shared. Um, And Gracie, as ever, thank you. Thank you so much to our amazing dance world that holds us up and gives us hope and challenges us and gives us all all the things. And um, thank you everybody for tuning in to Creative Vitality Jam Sessions 2020. I'll see you again in 2021. Thanks guys. Thanks, Helen. So much, Helen. Thank you for everything you do. Oh, thank you so much. Mwah. Let's keep reimagining creativity. Bye. Bye. Bye.